Well, I was trained actually as a geomorphologist at University College London, part of London University. And when I came to Victoria, I became interested in the applied side of geomorphology, which was looking at things like floods and earthquakes and so on. In fact, uh, together with a, a student of mine, we produced the world's first model of an earthquake destroying a city. So I was very interested in, in the more physical types of disasters. Well, of course, the AIDS pandemic is just a very, very large disaster. And you can apply the same sorts of models and strategies to dealing with the AIDS pandemic that you can apply to other types of disasters. So there's a great overlap there. HIV encodes for an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase. What that means is it has a, in its genetic code, it has a gene that allows it to make an analog of that particular enzyme. That enzyme plays a crucial role in the human immune system. So what happens uh, when somebody is infected and HIV keeps replicating, it removes the nutrients from the human body that are required to make the enzyme that is very protective against HIV. So it's a wonderful evolutionary gimmick on the part of the virus. So what we see then in AIDS is the removal of the four key nutrients that are at the core of that enzyme. They are selenium, glutamine, tryptophan, and cysteine. So what happens when somebody is selenium deficient? Well, if they're very selenium deficient, their immune system collapses because we know selenium is essential for, I think, at least 18 different functions in the human immune system, including, of course, the production of T lymphocytes. As the AIDS thing has played out, uh, Dr. Foster has investigated uh, the relationship of selenium with HIV infection. And incredibly, since the early 80s, it's been known that AIDS patients, even early on in the disease, have lowered blood levels of selenium. And as the disorder of the immune system progresses, the selenium levels diminish further. The intriguing uh, association that Dr. Foster has, uh, has researched is the role of selenium with an important enzyme in our body called glutathione peroxidase. And this enzyme system, which protects our cells against oxidative stress and damage, this enzyme is a selenium-dependent enzyme. And that's why these elements have been added to uh, the current uh, supplementation trial that we are carrying out at Mengo Hospital. There have been several different trials in Africa. To, to me, the most interesting are the one that is running now at Mengo Hospital in Kampala, Uganda, where the patients all were HIV positive, but were not AIDS patients. They had a T lymphocyte count above 200. Because by law, if they had a count below 200, they had to be given antiretroviral drugs. So what we seem to be seeing in that trial, and we haven't broken the code yet, but we know a lot of the patients have put on weight, they are in much better health, their T lymphocyte count has gone up, and so on. It seems to be showing that you can prevent people who are HIV positive passing into AIDS if you give them the right nutrients. The first trial was we took out some of the um, supplement uh, in the summer of 2004. You know, we started with 40 patients, and over two or three months, the numbers diminished to about 20. And so there was a big fall off in the number that were coming back for because of issues of organization and the way the clinic functioned. But. When I went back in 2005, there were still 11 or 12, almost exclusively women who were continuing to come. They all reported very dramatic improvement. In fact, there were some that had gained eight and 10 kilos in weight, which seemed astounding to us. And that led us to feel we needed to do a proper trial, a control clinical trial. Andy 
antiretrovirals uh, obviously are the standard of care for advanced AIDS in the West. And we've developed a, a system of caring for the million patients with HIV infection in Europe and North America uh, that is dependent on these very expensive uh, antiviral drug. Africa's problem is different. They have 32 million patients. They have a very impoverished health structure or, or limited uh, resources. And I think there needs to be another, so, another African solution to this problem. Now, the much smaller open trials that have been going on in South Africa where Marnie Bradfield has been giving Nutramiracle to dying AIDS patients. These are people who were much sicker than the patients at Mengo, who probably had very short time left to live. What we have seen there is it is quite possible to take dying AIDS patients, give them the correct nutrient and get those AIDS patients back to good health and back to work. If the world would accept Harry's work on selenium, we can do to, to AIDS, HIV AIDS today, what the American government did to Bellagra in 1942, when they mandated the addition of niacinamide to white flour, which destroyed a major epidemic in the southeast United States. Within three years, a disease that killed as many as 30,000 people in one year was under control. Just by the addition of a few pennies worth of niacinamide to our white flour, we should do the same thing with selenium, put it into our food. The problem is not scientific. The problem is entirely political. We have to persuade the public that this is the way to go. And it could be tested. They don't have to take it on faith. They could run a test beautifully. What I can't understand is why it takes so long. And when the thing is so obvious, it's like the nose in your face. It seems to me, how can people even object to this sort of thing? In 1535, I think it was, Jacques Cartier was exploring the St. Lawrence. His boat and crew got trapped in the ice, and they had to winter on land. They were dying in large numbers of scurvy when a First Nations a uh, warrior, I suppose you, you would call him, came up and said, why are you dying like that? All you have to do is to scrape the bark off that, the white fur, boil it, and drink the water. Having absolutely nothing to lose, except this, the crew dying from scary, they did that, and they all recovered. When Jacques Cartier went back to Europe and told the doctors, they said, we're not interested in the views of ignorant savages. It's rubbish. We know that scurvy is caused by the dirty vapors coming up from the bowels of the ship. In the time between Jacques Cartier being told how to cure scurvy by First Nations people and the British Navy adopting limes as a treatment for scurvy, millions of sailors died agonizing death all unnecessarily. That is what's happening now. Millions and millions of people are dying unnecessarily for AIDS. Nobody needs to die from it. But of course, I am today's ignorant savage. A geographer cannot work out what causes AIDS and how to reverse it. When biochemists, virologists and so on have spent 25 years and untold billions of dollars trying to find the same solution. So they will not listen to ignorant savages any more than the doctors would listen to ignorant savages when Jacques Cartier came back with the answer to scurvy. There is a big difference, of course, between scurvy and HIV AIDS. Scurvy, thank goodness, was not infectious. HIV AIDS is infectious, and it's spreading like wildfire. So we cannot put up with objections that are based on status, based on money, etc. We don't have that luxury. <laughs>